All right, Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Uh, Kevin DeYoung is uh, a pastor of a Presbyterian church in America. He's a professor of systematic theology at the Reformed Theological Seminary, and he's an author of many Christian books. Uh, Jacob and I have been using his book, The Lord's Prayer, as a resource for this sermon series. And I mention all this because I'm particularly indebted to Kevin DeYoung uh, for this sermon. Uh, I found uh, the chapter on this uh, passage very, very helpful. So I've pinched a lot of his ideas. But I want to ask you this morning, have you ever felt in danger? Australia is a pretty safe place to live, but there are some pretty dangerous places to live around this world. I remember a pastor from South Africa expressing his surprise that in Tassie, parents let their kids go take their bikes to the local park without any supervision. He said, we would never do that in South Africa. It was far too dangerous. Uh, One of the few times I felt threatened was uh, one day I went to visit uh, an elderly lady from our church many years ago, and while I was there, her brother turned up, who'd just been released from jail, and he started to accuse her of stealing money. And uh, I tried to calm things down, and he actually turned on me and started threatening me and saying, telling me all these terrible things that he'd done to other people, and he said, I'll find out where you live. And it was pretty scary stuff. Thankfully, I had some uh, people in high places, uh, not only God, but uh, a police officer who sorted that out for me. By God's grace, we don't face physical danger very often. But have you ever thought of the fact that it's also by God's grace that we don't face spiritual danger very often as well? Because the Bible is crystal clear that we are surrounded by spiritual dangers every single day. Uh, The Apostle Peter says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And the Apostle Paul says, We wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Jesus' disciples were keenly aware of the spiritual battle that they faced every single day of their lives. In fact, Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The last thing Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer is our need to pray for God's help because we're in serious, serious spiritual danger. This morning, I want to look at what it means to pray, lead us not into temptation. We're going to look at three types of temptation, what it means to pray for God's leading, and we're going to compare Jesus' temptation with our temptations. But before we do all that, I just want to sit this sermon in the context of the previous two sermons. These last three requests in the Lord's Prayer express our three great needs as people. Our need for provision, 
for daily bread, our need for pardon, for forgiveness of sins, and our need for protection, deliverance from evil. As Kevin DeYoung notes, our stomachs need to be filled, our sins need to be forgiven, and evil needs to be fought. In fact, these three requests are almost Trinitarian. God the Father is our creator who provides our daily needs. God the Son is our saviour who provides pardon for our sins. And God the Spirit is our helper who gives us power to live holy lives. Jesus teaches us that flowing on from our uh, daily needs and our forgiveness is a desire to avoid falling back into sin. We don't just pray that God would forgive us our debts, we also pray that God would lead us not into temptation. So let's take a look at that word temptation. The Bible speaks of three different types of temptation. The first way the Bible uses this word is to describe trials and tests. James, the brother of Jesus, says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The word trials is the same word Jesus uses for temptations. And notice that James says we'll face trials of various kinds. You'll face all sorts of trials in your life. And notice the purpose of these trials. They test our faith with the purpose of producing steadfastness, of strengthening our faith. So temptation can refer to the general suffering and struggles that we are called to endure as God's people. And trials aren't sinful in and of themselves, but they can cause us to doubt God or to compromise with the world, or to give up on our faith. So that's the first way the Bible uses this word temptation. Secondly, the Bible uses the word temptation to describe external enticements to sin. Peter talks about how false prophets entice unsteady souls. Jesus talks about how the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Paul writes, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So Satan and the world and even other people can tempt us away from pure devotion to Jesus. They can entice us to sin. They can entice us to reject God's ways and go our own way. In fact, in our text, we see Satan tempting Jesus, which we're going to look at in our third point. But like Jesus, you and I will face external enticement to sin. But thirdly, the Bible speaks of temptation as internal enticements to sin. The, uh, James again writes, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. I don't know if you've ever heard the quip, Satan made me do it. But the problem with that statement is Satan doesn't make us do anything. He only entices us to do the things that we already actually want to do. We are ultimately enticed into sin by our own sinful desires. So Jesus faced trials and external temptations to sin, just like us. But he never had internal enticements to sin because he had no misplaced desires in his heart. Jesus says stuff like, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus was never tempted by sinful desires because his desire was always to do his father's will. But you and I, we face these internal sinful desires. 
So what does it actually mean to pray that God would not lead us into temptation? Well, firstly, it doesn't mean asking God not to entice us to sin because God doesn't lead us to sin. God never entices his people to sin. Again, James writes, let no one say when he is tempted, sorry, I'm always behind, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. God never wants or encourages you to do evil. It's not in his nature. But God does test our faith. David writes, the Lord tests the righteous. God does allow, uh, allow trials into our lives to test whether we will be faithful to him. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God may allow you to face temptations, but his desire is that you would not give in to it, that you would endure it. In fact, God provides a way of escape, ways for you to resist that temptation. So when we are tempted, God wants us to turn to him in prayer and ask for his help in that moment. When we're tempted, God wants us to go to his word and, and look at how he wants us to live and respond in that moment. When we're tempted, God wants us to go to his people and ask for their help and their support. God might test our faith, but he never leads us into sin. So what does it mean to pray, lead us not into temptation? Well, the key word there is lead. Jesus doesn't say, Father, do not tempt us. Rather, he says, do not lead us into temptation. Jesus puts it in the negative, do not, but you could also put it in the positive, which would be, lead me away from temptation. To pray this prayer means to ask God to lead us away from sin. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus says in the second part of this request. Deliver us from evil. He puts it in the negative and then he puts it in the positive. Both halves of this prayer are saying the same thing. Father, keep me away from the law of sin. Do not allow me to be in a situation where the enticement to sin will be greater than I can bear. Help me see the way of escape that you have provided so that I might resist that temptation. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we are praying that God would help us win the battle against temptation and sin in our lives. We are praying that God would lead us away from sin, that God would in fact help us flee from those sins. As Paul says, flee from sexual immorality and flee from idolatry. He actually says to Timothy about false teachers who are puffed up with conceit and have an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions and constant friction among people, imagining that godliness is a means to gain. And he says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. When we pray this prayer, we are asking God to help us flee from the things that tempt us. We are asking God to deliver us from evil. But you might be thinking at this point, but when we pray this prayer, we don't say deliver us from evil, we say deliver us from the evil one. That's our traditional form of this prayer, deliver us from the evil one. Why do we change Jesus' words? Well, the word Jesus uses for evil in the Greek can be either neuter, which means evil in general, or it can be masculine, which means the evil one. How you interpret it depends on the context. 
And, and many uh, people translating the Bible think the context is just evil in general. But I think there is a very good case for saying Jesus is thinking also particularly about the evil one. I believe Jesus is also asking us to pray that God would deliver us from Satan. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' teaching about prayer and the whole Sermon on the Mount comes pretty much straight after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Matthew 4 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in order to test his faith. When the devil tempted Adam back in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, Adam failed. When God tested his people's faith in the wilderness, they failed as well. Is that right? No? Ah, there. The big question is, would God's son pass the test? Would the second Adam be faithful when the first Adam failed? Would God's true son be faithful when God's son Israel failed? And as we see in through Matthew 4, is that Jesus passed the test, that he remains faithful to his heavenly father. And now Jesus teaches us to pray, not just deliver us from evil in general, but deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the devil, from Satan. Jesus is teaching us to pray, Father, do not lead me into that same situation into which you led your son, Jesus. We're not praying for a life set apart from suffering because, like God allowed Satan to test Job and cause him suffering, so he may well do the same in our lives. But we do pray for a life set apart from sinning. We don't pray for a life set apart from suffering, but a life set apart from sinning. In fact, I love that line in that new song we've been singing these last few weeks. Hear our prayer. It says, Not for ease shall we pray, but for strength that we may walk with you this day. We don't pray that God wouldn't test our faith in him with trials, but that God would protect us from Satan, that God would keep us from sin, that God would help us resist temptation. When we pray this prayer, we're asking God to deliver us from the schemes of Satan. The Apostle John finishes his first letter with these words. He says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. He who was born of God is a reference to Jesus. And when we become born of God, when the Holy Spirit moves into our lives, we can experience victory over sin because Jesus protects us. And he particularly protects us from Satan so that the evil one might not touch us. When you pray this prayer, you are praying for spiritual protection, that God would protect you from Satan by the power of his Holy Spirit. The Apostle John says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Spirit who lives in us is greater than Satan. When you pray this prayer, you are declaring your hatred for sin. You are saying to God, I don't want to give in to temptation. I don't want to do what is contrary to your will. When you pray this prayer, you are confessing your weakness to overcome sin. You are actually asking God that you need his help. When you pray this prayer, you're counting on God's presence with you to lead you away from temptation and to deliver you from Satan. When you pray this prayer, you are trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to resist temptation. When you pray this prayer, you are asking that your Heavenly Father would be your refuge when you face temptation and that he would come to your rescue and deliver you from evil. And like with every other prayer in the Lord's Prayer, we are praying this to our Father in heaven. I don't know how often my kids have come and asked for my help, but I love to help my kids. 
And God loves to help his children even more than the best dad. God isn't upset when we come to him for help. He loves it when his children come to him for help. We honour our Heavenly Father when we turn to him for the help that we need. When we declare along with the psalmist, my help comes from the Lord, or along with Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When we do those things, we bring glory to our Heavenly Father. Maybe my battery's running loud. And helping us isn't hard for God. As Paul says elsewhere, he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. God is able to help us in our time of need. Brothers and sisters, you need the Lord's help in your battle against temptation and sin. And he is waiting to help you. This is one prayer that you need to be praying every single day. If you pray every day for daily provision and daily protection or pardon, how much more do you need to be praying for spiritual protection? So let's unpack our text and compare Jesus' temptation and our temptation. Because the way Satan tempted Jesus is the same way he tempts you and me. And we see Satan tempting Jesus with three things. Firstly, Satan tempts Jesus with pleasure. After the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness, we're told, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Basically, if you are the Son of God, give yourself what you want. Turn these stones into bread. It's not that eating is sinful. The question is, would Jesus listen to Satan? Does Jesus love God more than food? Would Jesus pursue his personal needs and desires his way or God's way? And notice that Jesus fights Satan's temptation to seek his own pleasure with the source of his own pleasure. Verse 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What was more important to Jesus than food was doing God's will. What brought Jesus more pleasure than fulfilling his hunger was obeying his heavenly father. I want to ask you this morning, is your greatest pleasure God or fulfilling your personal desires? You see, David sings, your steadfast love is better than life. And the psalmist says, there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Is God your greatest pleasure? Because if he isn't, Satan will tempt you with other pleasures. If you don't find comfort in God, Satan will tempt you to find comfort in, in the praises of other people or in your material possessions or in sexual pleasure. Is God your greatest pleasure? But when pleasure fails to tempt Jesus, Satan tempts Jesus with pride. Verse 5 and 6. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He'll command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The temptation is for Jesus to prove himself to put his power on display for everyone to see. Satan even quotes scripture, which reminds us that just because someone quotes scripture doesn't make them a Christian. Satan actually turns a biblical promise into an opportunity for spiritual pride. It's not that Jesus shouldn't display his power. In fact, later Jesus uses his power to heal people and to feed people. 
But Jesus is meant to use his power to bring God glory, not himself glory. God's power reflects God's character. It's not a party trick. Again, Jesus quotes scripture, Deuteronomy 6.16. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. God does not need to prove himself to us. God does not exist to make us look good in front of other people. Like God does not tempt us, so we are not to tempt God. And while God might test us, we're not to test God. You know, Gideon putting out a fleece is an example of his lack of faith in God's grace. It's not an example you and I are meant to follow. Like Satan tempted Jesus to pride, so Satan will tempt you and me to make life about yourself instead of about God. But when pleasure and pride fail to tempt Jesus, Satan tempts him with power. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. The thing is, all the kingdoms of the world belong to Jesus anyway. What Satan was offering Jesus was a shortcut to power. Instead of going through the cross, all Jesus had to do was go through Satan. Instead of suffering, all he had to do was submit to Satan and he would get there. Satan always tempts us with the easy way. As Kevin DeYoung puts it, he offers us a crown without a cross, pleasure without the pain, success without sacrifice, and admiration without affliction. Satan tempts us to get legitimate things using illegitimate ways. He gets us to go after the right things in the wrong way or for the wrong reasons. Satan excels in deceiving people by twisting God's word. Paul says Satan disguises himself as an, uh, an angel of light. But Jesus refuses to bow to Satan. He refused the shortcut to power. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. There is no shortcut. Am I wrong again? Yep, there we go. There is no shortcut to power. There's only God's way, and often that way steers through suffering. It veers through the valley of the shadow of death. It's reached through the cross. The way to power is through humility. Like Satan tempted Jesus to take shortcuts to power, so he will tempt you and me to do exactly the same. I want to ask you, of those three, which is your weakness? Some people aren't interested in recognition or power, but their weakness is pleasure. They want to feel good. They want to be comfortable. They want life to be easy and fun. Satan will pander to your desire for pleasure. Other people want recognition. They want to be famous. They want people to notice them. They want likes and follows. They want people to pat them on the back and tell them how awesome they are. Satan will pander to your pride. Other people want power. They want to call the shots. They want to be in control. They want authority. Satan will encourage you to take any shortcut to get what you want. Some temptations won't even be temptations for you. And you will look down on people for struggling with those things. Not realising that in some area you are just as vulnerable as they are. Paul says, let anyone who thinks who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. Satan will use your weaknesses against you. And brothers and sisters, we are all weak. We may not live in a dangerous country, but the spiritual uh, dangers we face every single day are just as serious here as anywhere else in this world. I've met so many people who started the Christian journey but never finished it who seem so strong, so committed, 
but they fell into sin and they left the church and gave up on their faith. Don't kid yourself. If you love Jesus, Satan is your enemy and the world will hate you. So often we worry about our appearance and what we're going to eat and what other people think of us and what colour to paint the walls of our house, but we really think about the spiritual battle going on for our souls. Do you know your spiritual danger? We know we need daily bread and we may even know we need daily forgiveness, but do you know your need for spiritual protection? That without God's help, you are vulnerable to Satan and your own sinful desires. You cannot avoid suffering or trials, but you can pray for divine deliverance. I want to encourage you to pray, do not lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil every single morning before you do anything else. And I want you to believe that your Heavenly Father will answer that prayer. That he loves you and that he will give you all the protection that you need. That he will help you to find the way out that he provides that you might endure temptation. That he will help you stand against the devil's schemes. That he will protect you from Satan. The Heidelberg Catechism says about this prayer... By ourselves, we are too weak to hold our own even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning and Lord, we recognise that we are weak. That Lord, we struggle with our own sinful nature and our own sinful desires. That Lord, we struggle to resist the temptations that are all around us in this world that rejects you. And that Lord, we are weak when it comes to resisting Satan. Lord, he can seem big and scary because compared to us, he is. But Lord, our great hope is that in temptation and in sin and in this spiritual struggle, we can turn to you for our help. And that, Lord, you promise to help us. You promise to give us the strength that we need. You provide a way out for us that we can resist temptation. And so, Lord, I pray that when we feel tempted that, Lord, we would turn to you and that we would pray this prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lead us out of temptation. And, Lord, deliver us from evil. That, Lord, we would pray this prayer and and ask for your help against Satan, that he might flee from us. Lord, I pray that as we turn to you and to your word and to our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would deliver us from evil. Lord, help us to be the people you want us to be. Lord, you don't want to lead us into sin. You cannot do that. Lord, you want to lead us towards yourself. You want to lead us towards holiness. Lord, you want to deliver us from evil. So, Lord, we confess that so often we don't turn to you in those moments. And, Lord, we fall into temptation and sin. We get sucked into it by our sinful desires. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us turn to you in those moments, that you might deliver us, that we might bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.